Okay, welcome everyone. Like I said, my name is Erin Malcolm Brandt, and I am a project manager with the Building Performance Team here at the Center for Sustainable Energy, and I will be the moder moderator for today's webinar. Today we're going to explore how permitting and codes help us get to zero net energy goals. The information presented in this webinar will hopefully help municipal staff, developers, contractors, and architects think about how permitting and codes can best help support your z &E projects and plans. We'll be sure to leave time at the end of the presentation for questions, and we're asking that attendees please enter, please enter their questions into the question prompt in the webinar toolbar. Please enter questions into this prompt as they arise, and we'll address them all at the end of the presentation. We've muted all of the phone lines and will only be accepting questions submitted electronically. Next slide. For those who aren't familiar with the Center for Sustainable Energy, I wanted to give a quick overview. Since 1996, we've been partnering with local, state, and regional governments to advance clean energy. And a core part of our mission is to provide information and best practices like this webinar to help reduce barriers to clean energy adoption. We're unique in that we provide technical assistance in energy program implementation, as well as industry engagement and policy feedback as part of our core services. Our work has primarily been focused in California, but we recently expanded our assistance throughout the United States. Next slide. This webinar is part of a larger Zero to Energy project that we're doing that's sponsored by the San Diego Regional Energy Partnership. Last year, as part of our webinar series, we presented our Zero Net Energy Roadmap for local governments. And this year, we're continu continuing the webinar series, diving deeper into how, technology, how different technologies and policies can support the &E efforts. Earlier this year, we discussed the role of EV charging and solar water heating in reaching the &E goals. And you can find those presentations on our website. Next slide. Today we have four, uh, three great speakers who are going to share the, uh, their experiences um, at the intersection of permitting codes and zero net energy. We have Sash Constantine, the Director of Policy here at Center for Sustainable Energy. We have Marissa Spada, a Building Performance Project Manager, also here at CSE. And Celia King-Scott, Senior Engineer with DNBGL. To kick things off, we want to get a better idea of who's participating today. We have a quick poll question for you. So we're just waiting to get the poll question. One second. Great. So what category best represents you. We would like to know who, who's with us in the virtual room today. Great. So it looks like we have a pretty um, diverse uh, audience today of both public and private um, stakeholders, which is great because that's critical to uh, getting to zero net energy. We have one more poll question um, to get things started. How familiar are you with California's zero net energy goals? Great, and so again, we have a, a pretty diverse audience with a good mix of people who are either somewhat familiar or very familiar. So that, that's great context to get things started. So before we get into um, the presentations, I'm going to do a quick overview of some basics around zero net energy. 
The California Energy Commission defines a zero net energy code building as one where the net amount of energy produced by on-site renewable energy resources is equal to the value of the energy consumed annually by the building at the level of a single project seeking development entitlements and building code permits measured using the California Energy Commission's time-dependent valuation metric. Next slide. So there's a few things to uh, keep in mind regarding the Energy Commission's definition. So one is that the Energy Commission is exploring the possibility of allowing community renewable energy to substitute for on-site renewable energy for buildings that can't accommodate on-site renewables. The Energy Commission is also tying their definition to the value of consumed energy based on the time-dependent valuation, or TDV metric. This means that the amount of renewable energy necessary to offset energy consumption will depend on the time of day, season, and climate zone in which that energy is used. Also, a building does not need to be all electric to meet this definition. Natural gas and propane are accounted for in the TDV calculation. And lastly, for this Energy Commission's definition, it's not about operations. It's about how the building is modeled based on design and construction. Plug load and occupant behavior could make a Z&E code building very different from a Z&E performance building. To determine whether a building is a Z&E code building, building departments will have to rely on energy modeling documents submitted along with new construction permit applications to verify and enforce Z&E standards. It's also important to note that the Energy Commission's definition is different than other Z&E definitions, including the Department of Energy. As you can see here, the DOE is concerned with comparing actual BTUs used versus produced. And here in California, we're starting to see the Z&E definition evolve as entities are thinking more about how to achieve zero net energy, not only in new construction, but in existing buildings that may not trigger code when retrofitted. Next slide. So in regards to the state's goals for zero net energy, they're both ambitious and quickly approaching. By 2020, all new residential construction will be zero net energy. By 2025, all new and 50% of existing state-owned public buildings will be zero net energy. And by 2030, all new and 50% of existing commercial buildings will be zero net energy. Given that these dates are not in the too distant future, it's imperative that the building, that building professionals customers, and local jurisdictions understand what their roles are in reaching these goals. Next slide. At the state level, the primary regulatory mechanism for achieving these goals are the state building codes, Title 24, Part 6, and Appliance Standards, Title 20. These codes are revamped every three years or so, meaning we'll see a couple of more iterations of Title 24 before it requires v &E for new homes. Despite this, local jurisdictions can implement policies and programs now to get in front of these state mandates. And that's where our roadmap and the information in today's webinar hopefully come into play. Next slide. So as I mentioned previously, to help stakeholders navigate their net energy goals and better understand what they can do, we created the Z&E Roadmap for Local Government. And you can visit www.energycenter.org slash ZNE to find the roadmap. Next slide. So today we're going to dive into, like we said, permitting and codes in the landscape for ZNE. And we're going to be taking a look at policy at the national level. We're going to get a local, the local and state perspective on policy, ZNE policy and enforcement strategies. And we're also going to hear about reach codes and programs that are driving zero net energy. And so before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to do one more um, poll to get a sense of how your communities are approaching zero net energy. So we're asking, does your community or company have goals specifically related to zero net energy buildings? Next 
Great. So again, a pretty mixed um, response. Um, and it's exciting to see that there are several uh, communities and institutions out there focusing on CNE um, and that there's several others thinking about them. And hopefully there will be more after today's webinar. So to, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Satch Constantine. As CSC's policy director, Satch is responsible for overseeing all areas of, of public policy, including government and regulatory affairs, legislative analysis, strategic planning, program support, as well as providing guidance to senior management on local, state, and regional policy issues. Prior to joining CSC, Sash worked at SunPower Corporation, a multinational vertically integrated solar PV manufacturer, where he was responsible for strategic partnership and public policy. Sash also has experience in community development, forestry, energy codes and standards, building energy management, and carbon trees. Awesome, Thank you, Erin, uh, and good morning, everyone, although I, some of you may not actually still be in the morning. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an appetizer for today's talk. It's really just an overview and make sure that we are, we are uh, setting a baseline understanding of what, uh, what codes and standards and, and permitting perspectives uh, come from the national level, uh, and then you'll hear a lot more detail in, in, the, in the next two speakers after that. So um, I, I will quickly jump into it. Next slide, please. So obviously, uh, the U.S. does not really have a national energy code or standard. Uh, codes, as, as many of you know, are adopted and enforced at the state and local level, at the jurisdictional level. However, at the national level, we do have a mission. DOE has a specific mission to achieve the maximum practicable, practicable cost-effective improvements in, in, in energy efficiency at, while providing safe, healthy buildings for, for the occupants. And that, that mission really comes from the statutory authority established in the Energy Conservation and Production Act and, and subsequent amendments to the, the ECPA and EPACT and uh, Energy Independence and Security Act. Uh, so DOE provides models and tries to drive forward efficiency in buildings uh, without having a, a, a mandatory requirement. That's all set at the local jurisdictional level. Next slide. Specifically, uh, we, we break this down into two different areas. So DOE uh, looks at residential buildings, and the model code there is the International Energy Conservation Code, or the IECC, which is promulgated through the ICC process. Uh, that is on a three-year cycle. We're currently uh, looking at the 2015 IECC, uh, but 2018 is already in development. Um, this, this residential code has, in fact, really been, been helping push uh, energy efficiency uh, in, the, in the built environment. Um, we saw some, some dramatic uh, improvements, especially earlier uh, in the decade. And we're likely to see a big jump in, in, the, in the next one in the 2018 code cycle. Next slide. On the commercial side, uh, there are two codes that, that DOE looks at and, and works towards. One is the commercial side of the IECC, and the other is the ASHRAE or ANSI standard 90.1. 90.1 is, a, is a, a fluid standard. It's also on a three-year cycle. Uh, we are currently using the, the 90.1 2013 as the reference. In fact, if you look at the the 2016 California um, building code, it is aligned to the 2013 version of, of standard 90.1. Um, however, 90.1 2016 is now available with, a, with a 125 addenda from the 2013 edition. And we've seen uh, this commercial standard really drive efficiency, particularly between uh, 2007 and 2010. You saw dramatic improvements. Uh, I think we expect uh, uh, equally directional improvements, or equally forceful directional improvements in, in the coming cycles. And as Aaron said, and we're going to be seeing several iterations of these before some of the, the requirements here in California and in other states come into play. So it's important to pay attention to these. Next slide, please. There are also reach or stretch codes at, at a national level and, and in fact, at, at, a, at a state level. I just put two of them up here to, to talk about, the International Green Construction Code, or IGCC, and also the ANSI ASHRAE IES US GBC Standard 
189.1. Uh, we're currently in the 2014 version of that. Uh, these kinds of stretch codes or reach codes do offer flexible compliance. They're targeted at high performance buildings. And this is the area, uh, at least at the national level, where you start to see zero energy buildings or net zero buildings or zero net buildings. The terminology tends to, tends to vary. This is where you see that entering into the conversation. So this is kind of the, this is the, the push on the market. The standards, the model codes, the model standards that are then adopted by the state set, set a minimum bar, um, although some states like California try to push ahead. But then these reach codes, these stretch codes, really try to expand the field and push us towards, in fact, uh, uh, zero energy buildings. Next slide, please. So just quickly, uh, I want to throw this in there because I think it's important. These kinds of building labels that you see here are often tied to standards or tied to uh, achievement or performance against certain standards. Of course, building labels can apply to a number of different areas. You see a, a wide variety here, um, uh, including uh, labels aimed at the materials that go into building and other labels that are aimed at the performance. This slide, by the way, courtesy of the, the Green Home Institute. Um, so, you know, a variety of labels that are also helping to pull the markets along. We often think of the codes and the standards as kind of the floor of the house and things like labels and incentives as the roof, and you want to raise the roof as, at the same time that you're raising the floor. Um, I think these labels are, are, are part of that. They are, however, typically not mandatory. They're, they, they have a different function than, than codes. But they are about conditioning the market, and, and I, I think that's what the underlying theme of, of my intro here is. So next slide, please. All right. So as Aaron said, you know, we're really here to kind of illuminate the role of codes and standards and permitting in, in the move towards zero net energy buildings in, in our built environment. Um, we've already established that the enforcement of these codes happens at the jurisdictional or the local level. Uh, we know, for example, that 75% of U.S. buildings will either be new or renovated by 2035, a huge turnover in the, in the stock uh, and the performance of those buildings. And if we're going to push towards zero net energy, and, and there is a concerted push, you can see here the, the US DOE label for zero energy ready homes. Um, if we're going to push for that, we're going to be talking about multiple systems. We can reduce the energy consumption on site or, or in the community through energy efficiency. Uh, we can manage it through demand response. Uh, but we're going to have to produce some generation on site, some DG. We are going to have additional loads, new loads, like uh, electric vehicle service equipment, that EBSD that I have up there. So these new systems, both individually in terms of the technologies and working together as a whole system in the built environment, is going to require a lot of capacity building at a jurisdictional level. The, the code updates have to be processed through, and, and we know that just because a model code is published and ready at the national level doesn't mean the local jurisdictions are already up to speed on that. We're going to have to see streamlined permitting because many of these technologies require uh, a look from the local building office and require some sort of permitting or a permit pull to, to be installed. And how are permitting offices going to deal with the, the, uh, the interaction of all these systems? Um, and, and, of course, we're going to have to see performance benchmarking and disclosure to understand the difference between the way a home is built and the way that it's actually working uh, to try to highlight any, any problems that we see. So California and other states are certainly leading the way on this. I threw up a number of legislative uh, instruments here. SB 350 really establishes the state's goals both for clean energy and for building performance um, at a broad high level. AB 758, which actually preceded SB 350, was a bill to look at existing buildings and the energy efficiency there and set targets for how we're going to improve them and even move the, the existing buildings towards this zero net goal. And, and uh, like yoga, I'm from California here, so like yoga, that can be intentional and, and you may not ever get exactly there, but, but I think it's important to move towards that target. AB 2188, I put that up here because that's a streamlined permitting bill. It's specifically targeted solar. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But it's, it's an example of what we need to do in order to help codes and standards and then the permitting process actually move us towards our goals. And AB 802 is the Benchmarking and Disclosure Act, also very important as we move buildings towards ZNE. Next slide, please. So I said I was going to talk about, um, I said I was going to talk about permitting. Uh, uh, I wanted to focus in on solar. 
solar is one of the more obvious DG sources, and, and you know, we can get the energy used down in these buildings. Ultimately, we do have to uh, generate some energy to get to that net zero or zero net status. So this is an example of what we did with streamlined solar permitting. Soft costs, so the cost of permitting, the cost of acquisition, uh, the cost of interconnection, these are costs that actually make up a big portion of the cost of solar. And that might be true for DR technologies, for some EE technologies, especially new, uh, newer versions, let's say, of heat pump water heaters, for, for example. So this was the process that we followed to try to improve the, the permit to, to actual switching on of these, of these systems. Uh, this is the SunShot effort was supported by DOE, um, and you can see some of the partners that we worked with on the permitting guide here. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is the resource that we put out with specific regards to solar permitting, but you could imagine, just as in the last graphic, you could imagine this is a, a zero net energy guidebook, and, and you're going to hear about the, the roadmap that we've created. Um, I think it's the same idea, and, and borrowing on these kinds of outreach resources, these kinds of technical support resources, we can get to the point where codes are, are being enforced and permitted effectively, efficiently, and, uh, um, and safely. Uh, down to every jurisdictional level. Next slide, please. And finally, as, as I finish up here and, and turn you over to the really detailed talk about California and what what we're doing towards towards ZNE, I want to point out that codes, and standards, and permitting operate uh, with a with a really Im important need for outreach, outreach and education. Right? People have to understand. The market has to understand. You've got to have got to have market collateral, you've got to have media outreach. Uh, stakeholders like builders and architects and planners all have to understand what the resources are, what the goal is that we're driving towards. And then we need to provide training to all of those same stakeholders and to the, the building officials uh, who are enforcing the code and issuing the permit. They need to understand what's important to look at, what are the key safety constraints, what are the key energy constraints that we want to balance as we move towards the &E. So that's a really quick um, overview of the sort of national framework. Obviously, uh, the election has, uh, has changed the outlook from DOE, but I think, uh, or for DOE, but I think that you're going to see a lot of this continue. These are long-standing traditions from the Department of Energy. These are, these are effective efforts at building consensus around energy consumption in, in buildings across the country. And, and I, I think we can have some confidence that the, the policy leaders and the, the decision makers are going to uh, maintain this kind of a pace as, as we go forward in the, in the built environment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say thank you there, and I'll be open for questions later. Great. So as a reminder, we're going to be taking your questions um, through the chat box on your toolbar, and we'll um, have plenty of time at the end to answer all the questions. Before we introduce the next speaker, we have another poll question. We're curious if your city or, uh, city or, or jurisdiction conducts any education outreach to help stakeholders comply with the energy code or go beyond code. Great. So it sounds. It looks like there are a lot of um, a lot of communities already uh, putting out a lot of support uh, and resources out there, and, and that's great. All right. Our next speaker is Marissa Spada, who is the Building Performance Project Manager here at the Center for Sustainable Energy. In her role, she works to improve efficiency of new and existing buildings by developing code compliance resources, and educational programs for local governments and the building industry on California's Energy Code, Cal Green, and the Pathway to Zero Net Energy. Marissa's programs have paved the path to z &E by emphasizing energy efficiency first in buildings and project design, complemented by accelerating the adoption of renewable technologies, 
electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and energy data management systems to truly achieve a net zero threshold. MRSA also works closely with various building department and energy efficiency stakeholder groups, including the Southern California Regional Energy Network, CALVO, the International Code Council, Western HVAC Performance Alliance, and the California Energy Efficiency Coordinating Council. Welcome, MRSA. Thank you very much, Erin, um, and also thank you to those of you tuning in today's webinar. We're going to now jump into the local and state perspective on ZE policy and enforcement strategy. The purpose of this section, as the screen shows, is to provide an overview of how and where California ZE policy derived, where to find essential California Public Utilities Commission and California Energy Commission ZE guiding documents, how the state plans to carry out ZE requirements through codes and standards and where I'll be highlighting some of the 2016 Title 24 code updates, as Aaron mentioned, that will be effective January 1, 2017. We'll also look at how permitting is the driver of a successful and achievable Z&E rollout for the building industry. And lastly, we'll end with some examples of adopted Z&E reach standards and goals above state mandatory minimums, and I'll point you towards several Z&E case studies. So first, why is California doing this? I often hear this question or pick up on its sentiment when engaging with building industry stakeholders. Making invisible problems visible is the best way I can think to actually demonstrate why California is so focused on improving energy efficiency. And one reason why is, is really clear is that both energy generation and use directly contribute to the emission of greenhouse gases, and specifically carbon dioxide or CO2. With not just California, but our nation dedicated to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, curbing them at the emission source is a critical path to achieving our actual lofty goals. The graph here shows that 60% of our state's carbon footprint comes, like I said, from energy generation and use, with the remaining 39% being transportation. So 60% of the 443 million metric tons of CO2 emitted uh, is significant enough really to warrant this attention and a call for action to improving energy efficiency in our built environment. So now improving energy efficiency, um, you know, is a little more conceptualized. There are actual tangible benefits that people can see and feel, both an increased comfort when inside buildings, such as improved insulation that helps keep your building warmer or cooler longer, and also properly sizing your mechanical systems, like your HVAC systems, so that they're not either overcooling or undercooling. Um, and then with increased efficiency also has a direct pocketbook effect, um, whereas increased efficiency leads to lowering the cost of your actual energy bill. So a win-win. Um, and then as local government staff and efficiency professionals here on the call, you are the local authority agents tasked with approving and verifying projects that meet or exceed minimum efficiency standards. And again, that the permit and plan review process is the driver for ensuring that these projects actually meet the state standards and then in turn make our greenhouse gas reduction goals possible. But taking this a little bit further, I mean, we've all heard about greenhouse gases and CO2, but we really, you know, it's, we want to visualize what actually a metric ton of CO2 looks like. So um, here on the infographic that's commissioned by the U.S. Environmental Defense Fund, you can actually see what a, one metric ton of CO2 looks like. So in weight, a metric ton is equal to 2,205 pounds. And that could then be equated to a cube that is 26 feet 8 inches high. So multiply that one metric ton by California's annual 443 million metric tons, and you get 11,872,400,000 feet of CO2 generated by California. So that's approximately just the distance between Earth and Venus, or 20 million miles. So again, just conceptualizing the fact of you know, why we're even focusing on energy efficiency, that there's a greater goal in mind, and bringing it back home, um, that energy efficiency standards matter, and our path to ZNE is critical, and thinking all of this within the mantra of think globally, act locally. Okay, so now how is this actually all getting done? Statewide energy efficiency efforts are born from the 2006 California Global Warming Solutions Act, or AB32. And then also in October 2007, when the CPUC, or California Public Utilities Commission, with their decision 0710032, 
which forced the state to adopt the programmatic initiatives for new residential and non-residential Z&E construction. So in doing so, the CPUC and CEC, California Energy Commission, adopted California's first long-term energy efficiency strategic plan in September 08. Straight from the CPUC's website, the plan is, quote, a single roadmap to achieve maximum energy savings across all major groups and sectors in California. The strategic plan was updated in January 2011 to include a lighting chapter. But then also this comprehensive plan for 2009 to 2020 is the state's first integrated framework of goals and strategies for saving energy covering, covering government, utility, and private sector actions and holds energy efficiency to its role as the highest priority resource meeting California's energy needs. That plan then broke off into several specific market action plans. So taking the goals and strategies from the long-term strategic plan and then taking a deeper dive into actual particular building sectors as well as codes and local government. So you can see here that there are residential and non-residential action plans, a codes and standards action plan that's complete with some permitting and code enforcement strategies, which we'll dive into a little bit deeper in just a moment. But then also the CPUC and CEC, all within the framework of energy efficiency codes and standards, is producing a local government action plan that's currently under development. And I'm not aware of the date of release at this point, um, but I would just encourage you to check in with the Energy Commission or even CSC as we tend to post the release of, of large documents like this. So the final guiding policies and documents for z &E that exist in the Integrated Energy Policy Report, or IPER, and AB 758, California's existing Building Energy Efficiency Action Plan, as Saj had noted earlier. So with energy efficiency, IPER states that, quote, standards are a foundational part of California's long-term goals for meeting energy demand, resource conservation, and environmental stewardship. They avoid the lost opportunity of failing to make buildings and appliances efficient at their crucial point of construction or manufacture by ensuring that builders and manufacturers make appropriate cost-effective investments in energy efficiency to the benefit of all Californians. So what IPER actually does is it establishes Z&E new construction standards, further, further defines Z&E buildings and the steps to achieving our first Z&E goal in 2020, which is residential new construction. Then how AB 758 continues to fil facilitate this process is that it sets goals and strategies for existing residential and non-residential buildings, because we can't forget our existing building stock. Uh, and then it also includes a local government leadership strategy and an, an energy savings program opportunities. What's crucial to note for our local government partners here on the call is that funding opportunities from the local government leadership strategy will be coming out, um, and so I would, I would recommend that you uh, stay tuned as to what funding opportunities can be available to you through AB 758. So here, again, Aaron had, had uh, showcased these ZNE code, code timeline rollouts a little bit earlier, but I'm just going to dive into them a little deeper. Um, from all those policies and documents, it's how we landed on all of these goals. So first, uh, we see that new, all new residential construction will have to be zero net energy designed and constructed by 2020. And those standards are projected to be adopted in the Title 24 Part 6 2019 code cycle. So just three years from January 1. Um, all new and 50% of existing state-owned public buildings will need to be Z&E starting in 2025. The Z&E requirements for public buildings can be found in the Governor's Executive Order B1812. And you can, uh, after this webinar, uh, click on that link and be taken directly to that Executive Order. Uh, then the next milestone is that all commercial buildings will need to be constructed and designed to Z&E standards by 2030, and those standards are projected to be adopted in the 2028 code cycle. And then by that same milestone, 50% of existing commercial buildings will need to be retrofitted to Z&E standards. And the layout of those goals can be found in the Z&E Commercial Building Sector Action Plan. So here now we're going to dig into the, to the Codes and Standards Action Plan. As you can see, it was published in March 2014. There is an update actually currently under development. I'm not aware of the date of release, um, but I would again encourage you to follow uh, this, this plan. So for those of you that are already familiar with the long-term strategic uh, plan, you may recall that these two goals on the screen are actually taken directly from that. 
So the goals for codes and standards with respect to increasing energy efficiency and leading us to a zero net energy pathway, um, we, we can see that goal one is to continually strengthen and expand building and appliance codes and standards as market experience reveals greater efficiency opportunities and compelling economic benefits. The achievement of this goal is through the strengthening of the energy code and Cal Green codes, which support the strategic plan's building sector specific z &E goals. Goal two of the plan is to dramatically improve code compliance and enforcement. Very broad, <laughs> but bringing home the reality that we actually that we will actually achieve the energy savings through codes and standards, and that the local government permit process is the gatekeeper. So here's just a high high level um, overview of the five strategies that then come out of these two goals in the codes and standards action plan, and we're going to actually go through each strategy. Um, independently. So strategy one is to develop progressive initiatives through the advancement of building energy efficiency standards, or that's Title 24 Part 6, and REACH standards to enable market transformation and support high performance building design and operation in res and non-res sectors. Two examples of this implementation are, one, the Title 24 Part 6 and Part 11 code cycles being updated every three years by being updated every three years, but the building industry and local governments are easing into the z &E standards and have been actually for several code cycles now. The 2016 code will go into effect January 1, 2017 and is an improvement in, in, in energy efficiency requirements from the 2013 code in which we're in now. This is where successful and proactive implementation and enforcement at the local level really takes off. So a second example of, of strategy one is the state's control in defining energy efficiency standards by climate zones. You can see that California is separated into 16 climate zones that are determined by specific weather conditions respective of their region. So here we have a, an overview of the 2016 Title 24 Part 6 residential standards that will be, that'll be landing um, January 1st and that they are 28% more stringent than the 2013 standards. These updates to the code are incrementally improving energy efficiency standards by mandating an increase in lighting and HVAC ducting efficiency, and also tightening up the building envelope with high performance walls and attics. Then speaking to example number two of our strategy one implementation that I was relating to um, climate zones, is that you can see that these 2016 prescriptive requirements are, all, are climate zone dependent. So not every single jurisdiction in the state will um, have to enforce the standards unilaterally, um, but the standards will be very specific to the, to the climate zone and the geographic needs of uh, that will, uh, the geographic needs. Here we have the non-residential 2016 updates, and those are 5% more stringent than the 2013 standards. Um, and if I didn't mention on the last slide, the, that 5% actually means that from the 2013 standards, these 2016 standards are projected to increase energy efficiency 5% more than the mandatory standards of 2013. So in the same vein, um, the non-res standards are improving HVAC efficiency, lighting power densities, and some unique requirements that apply to installing power controls on idle and unused escalators and elevators. A really, really unique change um, in this code cycle. So for more information on these codes, I encourage you to visit, visit the Energy Commission's website. Cal Green now also has a role in energy efficiency and clean energy related goals. Most of the, most of the building energy efficiency goals defer to the energy code, but the additional purpose of CalGreen is to protect, restore, and enhance the environmental quality of the project site. Moving on to strategy number two, um, it's stated to develop and enhance the electronic infrastructure and supporting tools to enable the advancement of Title 24 Part 6 and compliance improvement. Examples of te technology tools that support the advancement of Title 24 that local governments can implement are online permitting systems. So we really encourage online permitting systems with unique features that, that include any or all of the, the below that make the permit process more straightforward, but then also allow jurisdictions to collect all necessary compliance information 
for the project either before the application is approved or before the final permit is issued. So for example, online permitting systems could, have, uh, could allow the submittal of Title 24 compliance forms and energy reports with the permit application, have fillable fields with data validation and instructions for applicants to ensure jurisdictions are getting all of the necessary project information, having um, the, the fillable fields themselves actually then generate the CF1R, which is a HERS residential form, at the time of application. So then the applicant themselves is not having to fill out a permit application and a CF1R independently. The system itself could be actually streamlining that, that process. And then lastly, um, another feature worth considering for those of you that have, line, have online permitting systems or are looking to adopt them is to have an application programming interface or an API that connects to HERS provider databases that then requires auto population of CF2Rs and 3Rs before the building inspector actually arrives on site. So before a building inspector within the scenario were to actually go out to a project site that's requested a final inspection, they would then be able to review the permit file through the online permitting system and verify that they have all the necessary compliance forms that are validating that all of the uh, necessary steps on the site have been completed. Um, a lot of times in, in the jurisdictions that I work with, I hear that inspectors get out to the project site and they don't have the project forms or the applicant doesn't have the project forms available to them, which requires the inspector issuing a correction and then requiring the applicant to either provide the forms at a later date or uh, if they haven't even completed the steps to produce the compliance forms, then the inspector has to issue the correction and come back out on site a second time. This delays the permit process you know, and, and increases frustration for both the, the jurisdiction side as well as the applicant. But here we want to highlight some really excellent examples of local governments who are taking this next step. So we have the County of San Diego with their Citizen Access Online Permitting Program. Um, I've included links to all of these programs just with the respect of time. Um, I won't go into all these in detail, but just want to showcase that the County of San Diego's pro, uh, online permitting system was um, unique and um, viable enough to receive the Acela Engage 2014 Customer Award. Then you also have GreenNet Permitting System, which is a regional permitting system in Imperial County utilized by multiple jurisdictions in that region. And GreenNet is actually a self-funded permitting system through the through the um, through parts of the permit fee that then go to um, supplement the the system's operation. So it's actually a no cost online permitting system to the jurisdictions themselves. And then lastly, we have City of Palo Alto Civic Insight. Uh, just another great example of a jurisdiction actually following strategy two and, and utilizing and enhancing electronic infrastructure and supporting tools. Civic Insight is not an online permitting system, but it is a, an electric, electronic system that building inspectors can use to update live information from the project site that then the applicants can access. So moving on to strategy three, um, enhancing education and training initiatives for improving compliance with Title 24 Part 6 and REACH standards. Um, some examples of that are local governments, CPUC, and industry stakeholder programs uh, that are really trying to bring education and outreach on energy code resource tools that, it, that encourage and increase the efficiency of project application, plan review, and overall staff training um, are, are shown here. So the statewide codes and standards program specifically provides Energy Code 8. And if you, uh, jurisdictions on the line are not familiar with Energy Code 8, I really encourage you to, um, to check out both their trainings and their excellent resources that help you walk through the Energy Code. Um, and then we also have cities like the, like the city of Chula Vista with their home upgrade carbon downgrade program and their sustainable communities program, bringing training to both staff and the community on zero to energy and energy efficiency uh, policies, emerging technologies, and um, the, all, all, the, all the above. Then we have Bay Area Regional Energy Network, or BayREN, which is a Bay Area specific codes and standards training program. Um, with respect to, to this topic. And then lastly, we have through the San Diego Local Government Partnership Program, a benchmarking coach. 
that's a direct um, service program to both local governments as well as building commercial building owners in the San Diego Gas and Electric Territory, where you can get live help both via phone or email on how to establish benchmarking in your jurisdiction or um, at your building. Strategy four is to expand coordination and outreach initi initiatives between regulatory and non-regulatory agencies and other key market actors to facilitate improvement of the standards. So this is essentially stakeholder engagement. And great examples that I've seen is through regional international code council chapters that are providing regular meeting forums for chief building officials, building department staff, and other, and other industry affiliates to discuss code compliance barriers, opportunities, and enforcement strategies. CALBO provides local governments with the building industry and code compliance resources via committees, annual education weeks, and legislative advocacy support. We also have local government uh, building z &E demonstration projects through CEC EPIC programs. And then also, um, we encourage jurisdictions to create a z &E roadmap for your own region or community, and that it is born out of an organized stakeholder engagement process. So very similar to the Zero Net Energy Roadmap that CSC has produced. We, this was born out of a large stakeholder engagement process and looks at the implementation of Zero Net Energy from a multi-stakeholder perspective, not just within the building design, but also in how jurisdictions are adopting ordinances or uh, streamlined permitting processes, looking to pay through other financing programs for uh, increasing financing opportunities for these large-scale retrofits, and then um, also providing education and outreach to necessary industry stakeholders. And lastly, Strategy 5 supports efforts towards standards, compliance improvement, and enforcement at the local level for building energy efficiency standards, both mandatory and REACH. And here we get to my favorite strategy, and, and that's the recognition of jurisdictions throughout the state that are getting ahead of the z and &E rollout. So here we have the City of Hayward, Palo Alto, City of Los Angeles, City and County of San Francisco, Davis and Lancaster have all adopted z &E or z and &E like ordinances that are really pushing the envelope for development in their communities that are getting ahead of that 2020 and beyond uh, z and &E threshold. And I apologize if I left off any other cities that have adopted these rate standards, but we thank you in, in creating this move of the needle. And then kudos to all of you who are looking to also adopt these types of ordinances. And I encourage you to reach out to any stakeholders or partners you have at these jurisdictions to know how they were able to achieve this. Um, and then uh, in terms of improving enforcement at the local level, we have a, a program here provided by CSC, the Energy Code Coach Program, that is launched in both the City of San Diego and the City of Chula Vista, where we staff an Energy Code Coach who is an expert in both Title 24 and Cal Green inside the building department one to two days a week that actually helps staff review plans um, and improve their overall knowledge of what triggers energy code and Cal Green in projects. So here we have now a list of z &E case studies and roadmaps. I won't have time to go through each of these, but that's why the links are provided so that you can take on the, your own independent research. But here are a lot of great examples throughout the state of actual buildings that have been constructed to z &E standards. So you can see um, the New Building Institute has a whole suite of resources for jurisdictions in the building industry. Um, the PG&E territory has put together non-residential Z&E case studies. Some unique aspects of that include school facilities, small and large office buildings, and a wastewater treatment plant. In the San Diego region, we have a non-residential retrofit Z&E case study. Um, in the community of Ocean Beach on Bacon Street, there's an architecture firm, Hannah Gabriel and Wells, who retrofitted a auto mechanic shop into a small commercial space into, according to z &E standards. And then as, as we've highlighted before, the z &E roadmap for local governments is, is full of case studies uh, that you can review. And then Caltrans actually is, is a more regional um, approach, has actually adopted a roadmap to achieve executive orders B1812 and B1612, and those are specific to the public agency's requirements to achieving z and &E. And then here is a list of resources that you can visit after this webinar that will assist you with various topics that impact 
how you achieve zero net energy. So thank you very much for taking the time today, and uh, I'll stand by for questions at the end. Great. Thank, thank you, Marissa. So um, before we introduce our last speaker, we have one more poll question for the audience. We're interested in whether you think California's zero net energy goals are aggressive enough. Interesting. So a majority of you are, are think that the, the goals are quite aggressive and um, and we definitely have a, a lot of work to, to reach those goals. Um, so our next uh, and final speaker uh, this morning is Celia King-Scott. Celia is a senior engineer with CMDGL Sustainable Buildings and Operations Group. Celia has over nine years of experience in the building and engineering consulting industry. She has her PE license in mechanical engineering and is a lead accredited professional for building design and construction. She is also an ASHRAE certified building energy modeling professional. Celia has extensive experience in zero net energy buildings, communities, and cities, and her current role involves developing whole building energy performance models, including computational fluid dynamics and daylight an analysis, analysis for both residential and commercial building types. Welcome, Celia. Thanks, Erin. Um, and thank you all for attending today and um, to the Center for Sustainable Energy folks. Thanks for having me speak um, at this webinar. So today um, I'm going to be discussing uh, the REACH codes and programs driving ZME. Now, there are both unique opportunities and challenges to achieve zero net energy, and it's really a matter of balancing these in order to achieve the aggressive end goal. So today I'll be talking about two programs that have followed REACH codes to help drive ZME in the marketplace. Next slide, please. So already today in the webinar, we've heard a few definitions of zero net energy. Um, and from both the state of California and the Department of, of Energy. But there's also the definition for, uh, that, that building owners really care about, which is over the course of a year, if a building consumes less energy than it produces within its boundary, then it's a zero energy building. Next slide, please. So how is the zero net energy process different from regular construction? Um, I'm sure all of you have heard um, about the zero net energy process and it really cannot, you cannot achieve zero net energy if you don't have this integrated design mindset process and tools. You've got to begin with that end goal in mind but also have this integrated team process where you have everyone kind of sitting at the table, the very early stages of design, um, invested in that end goal for, this, for your project. There was a lot of uh, iterative modeling for, for performance and economics to inform decisions. So there's some um, kind of shoebox modeling, math modeling er at the very early stages of design, um, but also kind of more energy modeling throughout, uh, high performance modeling such as daylighting, natural ventilation that I'll get into later on in my presentation. But these all help to really inform the, the performance, uh, to model the performance and inform the economics to uh, inform design decisions. Metrics of success, well, the payback may exceed more than five years, which is different from regular construction. And sometimes you won't have the investment of your building owner or developer because of the, because of the high ROI. Um, and the resulting energy use is all about behavior. So a zero net energy building is not a zero net energy if it does not perform that way a year down the road. And that is all about how the the occupants in that building are using that energy. I'm sure you've all heard the, the um, statement that buildings don't use energy, occupants do. 
Next slide, please. So how do we get these conversations started? Well, California obviously is, is one of the very progressive states in this area. We have uh, building codes and ordinances that have already been talked about today. Um, we also have really aggressive reach codes that a number of cities are adopting. Um, we also have local energy and community plans that really engage both the private and the public sector and really encourage this uh, climate action planning, sustainable design planning for, for individual projects and also a portfolio of projects. We have a number of policies that have been implemented at both the, the uh, federal and state level. There's also a lot of RFPs out now that are using this, this language uh, for z and &E. And I can think of just in particular um, you know, the unified school districts have a, have a lot of um, RFPs out now for z and &E, uh, modeling and um, performance. This also can be in lease language from um, a building owner or developer. There are some incentive programs that really encourage uh, high performance of z and &E, and I'll talk about one of those today. But there's also other industry tools out there, such as the you know, LEED version 4 has now is quite aggressive with the requirements in terms of what credits um, and the prerequisites, and as well as the associated tools that, that uh, LEED requires you to use, as well as the Energy Star Portfolio Manager that allows you to really um, look at a portfolio of your buildings and really look at where they're performing currently compared to the benchmark and, and what you would need to do in order to achieve to achieve zero net energy and also other high, um, high performance goals. Okay, next slide, please. So the, um, the two kind of, I, I put this in quotes up there, REACH programs that I kind of, I'm talking about today um, is the Sustainable Communities Program that um, DMBGL runs for Southern California Edison down here in Southern California, and also uh, the Bay Area Municipal Technical Assistance Program, um, and we already touched on touched on the um, Bay Area group already, so they're managed by the codes and standards. Um, but both of these programs are really kind of are the reach programs and really can help drive the market in terms of, of achieving z &E. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is the Sustainable Communities Program. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this was developed by the Southern California Edison. It is for both commercial and residential mixed use and multiple buildings. So it's really for master plan communities that have both your commercial and residential uh, building types. It is a design um, and incentive assistance. So uh, the purpose of the program is to have to be involved at the very early stages. So we want to sit down with the developers and the owners and the architects before they've even really considered kind of their, the, um, the full plan of their community. Um, the, a goal, the goals for this program are aggressive, sustainable design, energy efficiency, water efficiency, daylighting. And in the last uh, few years, we've really tried to, to move the market towards the e through this program. Uh, the benefits are you achieve you receive this funding pretty early on. Um, it, it really encourages that integrated design uh, process and collaboration, um, and promotes education and training uh, for the participants. Next slide, please. So balancing priorities. So when for the projects in this program, we've really got to look at both owners' interests design guidelines, different architectural styles, coordinating project teams, construction timelines, cost and marketability, and also development of the PB layouts. So a lot of these master plan community projects, they, they have a whole span, a length of life over like 10 years. And if you think about how much our code, the Title 24 code has changed, you know, you're looking at updates in the next every three years. So there's different phases to these projects, there's different building code requirements for these projects. There's also different project teams in terms of different architects and engineers. So it's really about coordinating those project teams, getting them involved early on so that we really have the owner's interest at, at, at heart, the best, best interest at heart, and we're really focused on that end goal of conserving energy. Next slide, please. So what is the path to uh, zero net energy? 
So in, in the case of the projects in this program, they're all new construction. So we really do have an influence at the very early stages on, in terms of uh, site orientation, uh, solar shade, topography. So we really look at how we can improve the passive design of the building. Um, in terms of lowering that thermal load of the building uh, with a better site orientation and maybe we can use some of the vegetation that's already there for some shading. Um, and then we look at what we, can we do to the envelope to also really improve the thermal performance of the building, building and lower that solar heat gain inside. And then we look at the efficiency of the lighting, plug load and mechanical equipment that will be installed inside that building and look at how we can improve the efficiency, what is the most efficient systems available on the market, and do we need to be uh, choosing kind of, you know, the, the, the latest and greatest and usually most expensive type system uh, to, serve, to serve that building if we've already really put a lot of um, time and effort into reducing that thermal load of the building in the first place. And then finally, we look at the renewable energy systems available and, and how, we can, um, how we can put generation on the site. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of modeling that goes on throughout the phases of this project and through this program. Um, at the early stages, we do a lot of benchmarking. So we, we look at um, you know, what type of buildings are going to be um, on this at the site and then we, we will benchmark these and, and come up with what their um, energy use intensity should be um, and where we want it to be um, in terms of reaching that end goal of zero net energy or is it just going to be high performance energy. Um, we also do a lot of solar analysis for the, for the uh, projects and looking at how much uh, is available in terms of um, area for, for the arrays. We also do uh, uh, computational flow dynamics, also known as CFD modeling. We do this in looking at both interior and exterior air movement for the projects. We look at visual comfort and daylight simulation. So we really want to improve the visual comfort for the occupants. So how can we harvest as much natural light as possible, but also reduce the amount of direct light entering the space, which can cause glare conditions. And then, of course, we do energy modeling throughout the stages of the project to really make sure that we're staying on track to achieve that end goal of Z&E. Z &E. Next slide. So I just wanted to talk about two kind of passive um, strategy analysis that we do for this program. One is natural ventilation. Um, and so uh, some of these master plan communities, it's usually in the, in the uh, regional area outside of LA, but we did have one community that was coastal, and they really wanted to look at the effects of, uh, they wanted to look at um, exterior airflow, look at the predominant wind conditions, and really see how they can orientate, orientate the, uh, their buildings to really um, incorporate some of that wind and really encourage natural ventilation, but also to not have kind of a wind condition where, where the occupants are going to be uncomfortable due to the acoustics or the, or the increased airflow. Um, so this is just a wind rose that we did uh, as part of this uh, natural ventilation analysis to show where the predominant wind, uh, what direction that wind is coming from and what kind of wind speeds we're looking at. Next slide, please. Um, another one of these uh, past analysis was kind of looking at the solar orientation of the buildings and also the roof area available. So we really wanted to encourage a lot of um, uh, PV and, and have these arrays on the roof, but obviously you have limitations in terms of what that roof actually looks like for architectural purposes, um, as well as is the building orientated the right orientation to really um, have the best solar uh, performance there for generation. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of one of the um, analysis that we did for a community there. So we're looking at a range of building types, single family, um, multifamily, as well as office, hotel, retail, and theater. Um, and then we were able to look at what the EUI was, the predicted EUI for those buildings, um, and then what was the available area in terms of um, um, on the site so that we could have this PV array and what would we need to achieve the net zero energy for the site. Next slide, please. 
And then again, looking at this rooftop PV capacity, um, what the net zero requirement is, and then do we want all flat roofs? What about the flat and gable roof combo? Um, Well-orientated gable roofs, um, and then also comparing this to the code minimum capacity. So this is for a project where we're really looking at these different architecture styles. We were able to help the architect um, um, because they were involved at this really early stage. Um, we were able to help them come up with the best um, combination for their for their development. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next program I'd like to talk to uh, you all about is this Bayran Municipal VME Technical Assistance Program. Um, so this is basically uh, a program offered by Bayran, and it invites all of the cities in the in the network to uh, look at uh, their city buildings and and see which are in desperate need of say a retrofit and could be be taken to um, a VME performance. Um, so it's a lot of project-specific systems engineering and cost analysis. We uh, look at lowering the energy use intensities of these existing buildings and also look at how much size they, uh, size is needed for re renewables and integrated storage. Um, we do a lot of modeling for optimized gas versus electric uh, for these buildings. Um, and then we also look at the portfolio of ZE strategies and community scale ZE. Um, so how can we, okay, if we're looking just a single building, how can we then expand this, scale this up to looking at all of your city buildings? Um, and it's a matter of monitoring performance of buildings and portfolios. Next slide, please. So again, we are looking at this balancing act, but it's a little different for this program. Of course, we have the owner's interest in, in at best interest always um, to be considered, but we also have the local government ordinances and, and coordinating with the project team, but we also have these new construction retrofit schedules, so which buildings are probably the best for this program and which buildings are probably the best to, to look at in terms of achieving v and &E, um, versus does this building just kind of need a, a one system upgrade or something. There's also another um, component that's introduced um, through this program, which is the idea of natural gas. Um, and what do we do about gas? Um, again, markets, uh, cost and marketability and training and education are always important in terms of balancing them um, against this, still achieving this end goal. Next slide, please. So the um, city of Hayward is one of the cities participating in this program. And um, they passed a uh, municipal ZME ordinance back in April 2016. They're one of three total jurisdictions in California to pass this ordinance as of uh, quarter three. So Santa Barbara and Palo Alto were the other two cities. Um, so we were looking at community scale z &E for this municipal portfolio. Um, so there's just a little excerpt there from the city of council um, saying that all of their new city buildings uh, that begin design after January 1st, 2017 shall be zero net energy. And that um, all existing city buildings for which renovations exceeding 50% of the building's value um, should be v &E after January 1st, 2017 also. Next slide, please. But, so how did the city get there, you ask? Um, so how, how did the city of Hayward, well, how were they able to really pass such a progressive ordinance um, and, and, and kind of years earlier than what our, our um, strategic plan is kind of suggesting in California? Next slide, please. So in 2008, the city council adopted an ordinance requiring all new municipal buildings or renovation projects to be LEED Silver certified. Okay, so already they were pretty progressive, a pretty progressive city council for, for um, the city of Hayward there. And then in 2015, the staff presented a report for the Council Sustainability Committee, uh, committee recommending the following. So they wanted all new city buildings to begin design after 2025 to be V&E and all existing city buildings um, that again have a major renovation exceeding 50% of the building's value to be V&E after 2025. But then they did this analysis of their existing building stock and saw that they really did need to make this earlier. And so they moved up this date and moved forward to 2017. Next slide, please. So what's next? 
okay, so now the city of Hayward has this ordinance in place, and how do they get there? Um, can they go full municipal z &E by 2025? Um, we will need to validate the solar potential assumptions that were made. Is it going to be cost effective? What rate tariff are they going to be using? How do they deal with gas, which is one of the big questions here for this city, and, and can they do it sooner? Um, so these are all the questions that they kind of uh, approached us with when they were, um, when they were cut through that, this ZME technical assistance program operated by BayRAM. Next slide, please. So just a little map of the city of Hayward. They have over 30 municipal buildings um, in their city and in their region. So in order for all of these to achieve this VNE goal, they really had to be really uh, aggressive um, um, in terms of their in terms of implementation. Next slide, please. So we did an analysis for them on their existing municipal energy use in terms of electricity and gas. Now you'll see there, uh, the, the red region, the first bar there, is represents natural gas. I've just done a unit conversion to get them in the same units there. Um, so we're looking at a municipal energy use of 26.4 gigawatt hours. Um, and then they can op they've offset uh, with their biogas cogeneration, 9.4 gigawatts of this. They also have wastewater solar offset of 2.4, distributed solar 0.6. And so in 2016, they had a remaining of 14 gigawatt hours that they would need to um, take care of in order to achieve the ZME. &E. So it, it, it was uh, no small feat here for the city of Haywood. Next slide, please. So looking to the future, how are we going to get there for, for them? How are we going to um, look at all of these buildings in the city and, and really take them to that ZME um, target that they, that they still want by um, beginning 2017? So um, we looked at LED retrofits on all of their buildings, and this was taking them to uh, a reduction in 0.4 gigawatt hours. Um, and then we did other energy efficiency measures, such as envelope and HVAC, um, uh, improving the HVAC in, in their buildings. And so that took down another 0.6. And then we looked at what we could provide in terms of generation. And the solar potential was about 8.6 gigawatt hours. And then they had this remaining 4.4 gigawatt hours of gas usage that we didn't know what to do with. Um, and you'll see that's quite proportional there with the beginning um, um, municipal energy use before we even looked at um, any of these strategies. So we looked at offsetting this by PV, but it just we just was not cost effective. So we had a number of uh, strategy meetings, and they're still ongoing with the city um, in order to come up with the best approach to, to offset this remaining gas. Next slide, please. So in December, so we have five of these solutions here on the slide today. Um, was what we came up with as a group um, working with the city of Hayward there. And in December, additional funding from the program um, was approved for a follow-up study on the feasibility of these five options. So we're looking at installing a second code generation engine. We're looking at electrifying all of their municipal buildings. Um, we're looking at possibly uh, wheeling gas through the PG&E pipe, uh, pipeline. We're also looking at uh, trucking biogas CNG storage tanks at buildings, that's at the building site, and also creating biogas vehicle fueling stations for all of their the fleet of their uh, city vehicles. Um, so there's a number of options presented here, and we're still kind of in discussions about what is the best um, to, in order to move forward and, and with that uh, and still achieve the ZNE &E goal. So just kind of to summarize the next slide, thanks. So just to really su uh, summarize this, it's a matter of balancing priorities for the uh, design. And I just talked about two separate kind of reach programs that have, have little, uh, some different kind of um, interests that we need to take care of in terms of, of um, achieving that uh, the main goal and conserving the energy there. Um, but the majority of it is always the owner's interest We've got to look at local government ordinances. You've got to always coordinate your project teams and look at your project schedule and how you can kind of stage this out, plan this out, in order to uh, make sure that end goal of ZNE is achieved. 
and of course more costs and marketability, training and education are so important in terms of driving the market. People look at, uh, at, at these buildings as kind of as, as the needs buildings that showcases for the community. They really do offer that kind of engagement for the community and help drive that market you kind know, of achieve uh, achieve uh, the need further further down the line. Okay, I think that's all for me today. There's my contact information if anyone um, yeah has any other questions, but I think we're kind of opening up now. Thanks, Erin. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celia. So I want to thank all of our speakers for their great presentations. We're going to um, use the next few minutes for um, any questions that people have. For those that need to jump off the webinar now, I do want to make sure um, that we get your feedback and any thoughts um, you can provide will help us identify next topics and recommendations for our future webinars on b &E. So you'll be receiving an email shortly um, and uh, we ask you to just do a quick survey. We, we'd really appreciate it. I also want to let everyone know that um, we will be sending out a link um, with the presentation and the slides so that you can have it as a future resource. And we'll also be featuring um, the webinar and the slides on our website. So um, getting started in terms of questions, I just want to remind everyone that um, you're welcome to use the chat box uh, for any questions that you might have. Um, Marissa, I want to start with you. You mentioned um, the Code Coach program um, that uh, we've been supporting in some of the municipalities, and I was wondering if you could uh, expand on that a little bit to tell everyone about the program um, and how other communities could emulate it. Yeah, thanks, Erin. Happy to. Um, so as I mentioned, in the city of San Diego and city of Chula Vista, through local government partnership funding, they have implemented what is called um, the Energy Code Coach Program. And what we do in those jurisdictions is we provide a suite of training for both in-house building department staff, so permit technicians, plans examiners, and building inspectors on relevant energy efficiency code and compliance information. Um, we tailor those trainings to the actual needs of the staff. So we, we survey in a somewhat informal way the needs of the barriers that they're experiencing with their project work or what you know, knowledge gaps they have. And then we actually target these trainings for that staff. Um, and then we also, in turn, host a series of community trainings uh, where the jurisdiction can identify topics of interest around energy efficiency, zero net energy, and emergency emerging technologies, um, and then we bring in industry experts to an in to host an in person community event. Um, it's usually an hour and a half, a lunchtime event, um, and it's just a great way for uh, furthering that education and training requirement that you know is aligned with the CPUC's long-term strategic plan. But also it's a great way for industry stakeholders in the region to network. And I've seen a lot of great conversations from the attendees of these trainings that we host in the community um, where people are changing contact information, you know, connecting the dots between uh, what they're doing at their company or organization and, and you know really just starting to make this, this process a lot um, more effective and achievable. Um, so those are two elements. But then the Energy Code Coach themselves, they are, like I said, experts in the Energy Code. They typically have plan reviewer experience or are previous energy consultants. And they also are very familiar with Cal Green, um, may have LEED certification or at least um, an affiliation with the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, and so they sit in-house one to two days a week at the, at the counter or behind with the plans examiners and actually walk through plans together and really figure out when, um, some, when a code trigger applies to the project or more importantly, and this is more consistently, what information on the plans related to energy code in Cal Green is missing. So when I noted um, specific, uh, specific to the technology and electronic um, advancements that jurisdictions can adopt, uh, I 
didn't have a chance to highlight, but the energy code calculations uh, that are that derive from Energy Pro software or any type of energy modeling software, that information should be actually on the plans themselves. And what we see a lot is that the information on the plans may come in the first draft, but when corrections are issued by the the um, plans examiners themselves, sometimes that information doesn't get transferred back onto the revised set of plans or not onto every set of plans that is required. So it's really important that plans examiners and through the assistance of our energy code coaches helping to condition this type of practice, that it's important for them to ensure that the energy code requirements that were on the first plan set, if they were all correct and consistent, are can then streamlined and consistent throughout the um, the plans reiterations um, because ultimately we know that the final plan that gets actually onto the building site is actually what's ultimately installed and that it's then if something does not align or is not compliant with the energy code when the building inspector gets there and they see that you know things need to be corrected there's a lot of you know frustration on both the, the jurisdiction and applicant side when they're saying, well, what do you mean? It went through plan review, things like that. So through the, the implementation of this program, a lot of these um, issues, you know, we've seen and heard from the jurisdiction partners have, have decreased or at least are being identified and addressed. So um, we're really thankful and um, happy to be working with, with these great agencies and um, is the, the um, our partnership is being really well received there as well. So happy to answer any other specific questions. Great. Thank you, Marissa. Um, Celia, we've received a few questions following up on your presentation regarding the use of gas, natural gas and what the, the role is going to be of natural gas as we um, move towards zero net energy goals, um, potentially with the idea of, you know, would we be eliminating natural gas as an option, and and what does that look like? So, do, can you comment on on those questions and comments regarding the future of natural gas? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Erin. Um, I mean, it's a huge, it's a it's a really big question um, in the kind of ZNE world um, right now. And um, I just attended the uh, Getting to Zero Forum in Denver in October that this was like a big question. Um, and there's, there's a number of opinions about it. Um, I think it will depend on the, the city, the region, um, the utilities, and how they want to get involved um, specifically. But yeah, in terms of uh, completely eliminating it um, with, uh, for code with ZE, I, I don't know if that's ever going to be possible. But people do strongly believe that we're not going to achieve the ZE um, if we don't completely eliminate it from out from the building stock. Um, I, I sorry that that's not a great answer, but I think it's just a really um, kind of big uh, uh, question right now that uh, that's kind of got a number of, of different uh, discussions associated. Thanks. And uh, Sach, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, if I can jump in on that, I, I, Celia, I think that I think that answer is is absolutely correct. Uh, in the in the near term, um, I wouldn't expect code uh, to eliminate a pathway for natural gas use in the home. However, if we look at over the medium term and the long term, if we look at 2050 goals in California or even across the country, for example. We really have to think about what our carbon budget is in in general, and if Z and E is a part of our greenhouse gas emission reduction scheme, then the carbon budget applies, and we may need to think about replacing combustion of natural gas in homes uh, with electric appliances. So fuel switching, gas water heaters for heat pump technology, for example, may in fact have to be considered in, in out code years, so out, out several cycles. Um, but I think in the short term, uh, we're not going to see that. I, I think without wanting to comment too deeply on the national scene, I think that over the next four years, we're certainly going to see uh, a, a much stronger natural gas lobby. Uh, and, and any attempts in code to eliminate natural gas could, could potentially be problematic. But I do think we need to think about the issue of fuel switching sooner rather than, than later. Um, and 
this will certainly be an, an interesting question for, for ZE and, and for state policy in general. Of, of course, natural gas technology, uh, the, the pipelines, the delivery mechanisms, the, the end use applications could also be used for biogas with a much smaller carbon footprint, for example. So, so how, how this works in future is certainly an interesting question, but I, I think for the short term, uh, I, would, I would not expect code to, to mandate fuel switching. Okay, thank you. Hi right, everyone, well, um, we're getting close to 11.30, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, if we didn't provide an answer to any questions you have now or in the future, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to uh, speak with you further on these subject matters. Um, like I mentioned before, we'll be sending out a link to this webinar, and please um, be on the lookout for our quick online questionnaire that we'll be sending out shortly. Thanks, and have a good day.